Hi again, Mark here from Talking Bass. This week we're going to look at the picking hand and 10 aspects of finger picking that might be causing your problems or that just generally suck. I'll break down the common hurdles and give you some technical tips for fixing any bad habits that you might have acquired. As always, the lesson material is all there over at the Talking Bass website, just click the link in the info below, and while you're there, sign up for free to join the Talking Bass membership. There's a ton of free educational downloads, lessons, forums and chat groups, and over 100,000 bass players all signed up and chilling on the site. So just sign up, it's totally free, and join a great bass community. Okay, so first on the list of finger picking problems is picking strength. You might be playing too hard. When you first start out, you'll tend to just pick at those strings based on, you know, whatever mood takes you. A lot of the time, if you're practicing acoustically without an amp, that might mean whacking the hell out of them like this. Now, there are a bunch of reasons to avoid hitting the strings too hard. For a start, you'll reduce your stamina, the tone might be totally wrong for the song, you'll reduce the sustain, you might injure yourself, and you know, the list goes on. Yes, there are times when you obviously want to play harder and cre uh, create more of a snap out of the string, but if you play hard all the time, you'll have no dynamics, there's nowhere to go. So, try raising the volume of your amp a little and play a little lighter. Let the amp do the work, and then when you need to dig in, you can emphasize those notes a lot better. You'll be able to play for longer, you're less likely to hurt the hands on a long gig, and you'll improve your sustain because you won't be dealing with a hard, fast transient and sudden drop off for the sustain part of the waveform. And as an extra bonus, you're going to gain more speed. If any of you have had problems increasing the speed of your finger picking, play lighter. This is exactly the same as playing drums. The more you tense up, the more you're going to hinder your technique. The faster you pick, the more relaxed you want to be. I talk about this in depth in the lesson that I made on Run to the Hills by Iron Maiden. If you're trying to play one of those typical Steve Harris galloping bass lines that sound like this, you're going to want to relax the hand a lot. If you tense up and play harder, your stamina and speed are going to be compromised. You know, it's, it's, you're just gonna tense up. Play lighter and you'll find achieving and retaining speed much, much easier. Second on the list of problems is your angle of attack. This is how the fingers point at the bass. At one extreme, you might play fairly flat-handed and hammer at the strings a little like Steve Harris. And at the other extreme, you might angle the fingers over to point directly at the bass. Neither of these angles or anything in between will be wrong per se. It might just be wrong for you or the music that you're playing. When you play flat fingered, hammering down, you're going to get more of that string clank as you whack down on the strings. And that's great for metal playing. But if you want a tighter, cleaner tone, then you'll want to angle inward. This combined with the lighter attack is gonna give you the cleanest tone. Like I said, this is totally based on context, but if you find that your playing just sounds wrong for the music, let's say that you're clanking away on a tight funk tune, angle the fingers inwards. There's no one size fits all position for the fingers. You just need to get a feel for all these little adjustments and use the appropriate technique for the tune. So if you're playing, let's say, some ghost notes and a, a more funky kind of line, angle inwards, you know, facing the actual bass. <laughs> And then if you're gonna be playing more of a metal line, you know, then you're gonna to wanna to hammer down. For number three, we've got the hand position along the string. This is just as affecting on the tone as the angle of attack. When we choose a picking position as a beginner, we're likely to just anchor over a pickup, usually the neck pickup, and that's it. And that might be fine, but there are a limitless number of tones available as you move the hand along the string from the bridge to the neck. At one extreme, we can play close to the bridge where the string is the most taut for a tight, more mid-heavy sound. Then for a warmer, more hollow tone, we can play closer to the neck where the string is more loose. Then 
then you can try out all the different areas in between these extremes. You might not notice the difference too much when practicing alone, but trust me, when you're playing at volume in a band, the differences in tone are going to be really, really noticeable. As with the angle of attack, this is all about context, and it's that reason that uh, might contribute to you thinking that your finger picking sucks. You might be playing great from a technical perspective, you might be able to rip through some technically difficult or speedy lines, but the tone might be all wrong or a little messy for the music that you're playing. Finger picking technique is just as important in deciding your tone as it is your proficiency at playing lines. Next up for number four, we have consistency of attack. This is something that I worked on a lot as a kid. When you move into two finger picking, you might notice one of the fingers is a little stronger or weaker than the other. This means that you're going to find one finger overpowers the other, giving you possibly unwanted accents. Accents are great, but you want to be in control of them. So as a quick tip, just try playing an eighth note pedal bass line on any note. So here I'm playing a C on the A string, okay? So one and two and three and four and, and listen out for the accents on one of the fingers. So you might get accents on the main beats like this. One and two and three and four and. Or maybe the ands, so the reverse, which would sound like this. One and two and three and four and. Either way, if you don't have a smooth, consistent tone, try dropping the attack on the stronger finger or raising the attack on the weaker finger. Either way, it doesn't matter, just try to level them out for a more consistent attack like this. For number five, we've got the opposite of number four, accents. You need to develop dynamic control in the finger picking and accents are an important part of that technique. You should be able to place accents on whatever beat or subdivision that you want, but remember, you need to be in control. So as a little exercise, again, let's try that simple eighth note pedal bass line. First try playing consistent unaccented notes. One and two and three and four and. Now try accenting each main beat. So if you're starting, on the, uh, starting the picking pattern on the middle finger, that's the finger that you're going to be accenting. So you want to have one and two and three and four and. So each time you're gonna be with that middle finger accenting, you're gonna play harder with that finger. One and two and three and four and. And now try the opposite. So if you're starting on the middle finger, you want to be accenting on the index finger. So we're accenting the ands. One and two and three and four and. Now let's just try highlighting a few different accents in the bar. So first of all, try beats one and three, okay? So we're going to play one and two and three and four and. Now try the and of one and the and of three. So we're going to have one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And now let's try some groups of three. This is a great exercise because we have to alternate the accenting finger each time. So starting with the middle finger, we're going to have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So first time we accent with the uh, uh, middle finger, then we accent with the index finger round and round. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And when you're doing this, just try playing lighter as your default, um, you know, when you're trying to get the consistent uh, unaccented notes. So just try to play it lighter with those and then you can snap in with the, uh, with the accents. So normally non-accented, nice and light, and then can really kick in with those accents. For number six, we have the thumb anchor. The position of the thumb is so important in locking down residual noise from the unused strings, and it can also help to keep a fairly consistent hand shape as you move across the strings. 
There are a few ways to address the thumb. You can anchor the thumb on a pickup and just hold it there. But um, I wouldn't really advise that. There are some people that do that, but the big problem that you're going to face is the ringing of the lower open strings. As you play it on the D string, or the G string, the lower strings, the E and the A string, the vibrations in the body and neck are going to cause those strings to vibrate, and that can sound messy and just plain bad. I tend to use a movable anchor when playing on a four string bass. This is where I move the thumb around to mute the unused strings as I shift across with the finger picking. If I'm picking on the E string, obviously I'm going to be anchoring on the pickup. If I move to the A string, I will either anchor on the E string or the pickup if I've got to move back in a hurry. So the A string, so if I'm coming back from let's say the A string back to the E string, I'll keep the thumb on the pickup, but most of the time I'll put the thumb there on the E string. Then when I move to the D string, I've got a choice. I can either actually keep that thumb there on the E string or I can move it across to the A string. Now you might be thinking, why not move it to the A string all the time? Well, what you can actually do is place the thumb two strings below and when we play that string using rest strokes, so the fingers coming to rest on the next string, that will actually in effect mute the next string along. So you can afford to be two strings away, but never four. So when I shift over onto the G string, I will usually have the thumb on the A string pulling back to mute the E string as well. So we've got the E string and A string locked down, and then there I am playing on the G string, and the D string is being muted by the rest stroke as the finger comes to rest after picking. Again, a lot of this is going to be based on context and how fast you've got to move across the strings. Um, if you're playing octave patterns, obviously you're not going to be moving the thumb each time. You, you, let's say that I'm playing an octave there standing on the A string, I'll just keep the thumb on the E string even though I'm playing on the G string for a fraction of a second. So again, it's all based on context. And if, if I've got to come up and down, very quickly, I might keep the thumb in place there without moving across, just because, you know, the notes are going to go by so fast, it doesn't really matter. But, rule of thumb, I will actually move across most of the time. One other popular technique is the floating thumb method that you'll see from guys like Gary Willis and Todd Johnson. This technique is similar to the movable anchor in that we move the thumb as we progress across the strings, but we keep a more consistent hand shape all the way. The thumb acts as a relaxed guide as we move the, the whole arm pretty much along with the picking. So if you want to learn more about this technique, I would highly recommend some of Todd Johnson's lessons over at his YouTube channel, or check out the interview that I did with him here on the Talking Bass channel. I'll link to both of those in the description below. I personally don't use floating thumb that much on a four string, but I will use it on a five string, because when you play on a five string, you're gonna have one extra string to take care of in terms of muting, and the floating thumb really, really helps out with that. You're basically just keeping that thumb there, muting the strings, so if, let's say we take the G string for instance, if I'm playing a C on the uh, fifth fret of the G string, the thumb will cover the D, A and E strings like this, and then as I come back, if I move on to the D string, I just move the thumb, or as Todd Johnson says, uh, moving the mechanism, we just come back, keeping the hand in a consistent shape. So either movable anchor or floating thumb techniques are uh, both fine. The main thing to be aware of is the residual noise and how you remove it with the thumb. This is all achieved with the picking hand and it's one of the other things that might potentially suck in your technique. Next up for number seven, we have the starting finger and general finger picking awareness. Now this might seem a little odd a thing to care about, but if you're going to use alternate picking when crossing the strings, the finger that you use to start your picking can have a major impact on the technique that you have to use going forward in a line, and it's one of the main reasons that you might find yourself finger twisted. One of the best examples of this is the difference between the popular fingerings for a major scale and natural minor scale. So if we play a C major scale as an example, We've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So starting on the third fret of the A string there, so third fret, fifth fret, A string, second, third, fifth fret on the D string, and second, fourth fret, uh, and fifth fret on the G string. You probably all know a C major scale. And then for a C natural minor scale, we just 
have a C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. But we're starting with the first finger of the fretting hand there. So, so we've got third, uh, third, fifth, sixth fret on the A string and D string, and then third fret, fifth fret on the G string. So C major and C natural minor. So if you stick to strict alternate picking through both of those lines, you'll find that the best option will be to start on the first finger, the index finger, for the major scale, and the second finger, the middle finger, for the minor scale. This is just because of how the fingers fall in order as you move through the scale in ascent and descent. The major scale starts with two notes on a string and the minor scale starts with three. So the picking finger that falls on the string crossing is gonna be different for both scales. The middle finger is the longest of the two fingers. So is usually the better option for string crossing in ascent. And the index finger is better for crossing in descent. Try starting each scale with both fingers. Take note of which finger is picking at which point, especially if you get a little finger twisted. And I'm sure that you'll agree that the first finger start is better for the major scale and vice versa for the minor. This is an important thing to remember when learning any tricky bass line. If you're having problems with the picking hand, try switching out the starting note picking finger and see how you go. It might make a huge difference. For number eight, we have raking. Raking is a technique whereby you pluck across several strings with one finger. Raking is great for adding a fluidity to your playing as you descend across strings and it's gonna help with gaining speed. So here's a simple bass line making use of some raking. So here we're in the key of D, I'm just using a D, A and D, 5th fret A string, 7th fret on the D and the uh, G strings, so it's that root 5th octave pattern, that good old pattern that you'll see loads of times in bass lines. So we work up through that, and then we drop back down. Okay, and then we raise up again, but we're gonna play two notes on the A, so. Then we play the D again and come back down. Now, there's nothing wrong with alternate picking throughout a line like that, and I'll actually purposefully practice alternate picking on odd lines like that just so I'm prepared for anything. But raking is a really useful tool for playing through lines like this. So I'm starting with the index finger of the picking hand there, so... And then I'm using it again on the D string, so we play it twice. Then I play with the uh, middle finger for there for the G string. Then as we come back down, I play the index finger and then rake down back to the A string. Rather than coming back with the longer middle finger. So if I alternate pick, I'm gonna have to pick with the uh, second finger, that middle finger on that D, you know, as we come back round. But with raking, we get a more fluid a more fluid line coming back down and it's a lot more comfortable. Then when we come back up and play the two notes on the A there, start with the first finger there, alternate pick. Then we play the D up on the top there on the G string with the first finger and rake back down again. And then you can just rake all the way back down to the A string. So. So at the end there, I'm just coming back down with that first finger all the way, just raking across. So you wanna practice something like this quite slowly, just really focusing on where those rakes are, you know, really putting your finger uh, picking under the musical microscope and then just build up speed. So you wanna start out really slow. And then just build up speed once you've got the, uh, the muscle memory down. Number nine on the list is strict alternate picking. Now this is the opposite of the previous look at raking and it's 
the instinctive and habitual choices that you're going to make when it comes to these two methods of picking that are likely to force you into getting finger twisted when playing a tricky line. Because the middle finger is longer than the index finger, you're always going to prefer string crossing in ascent with that longer middle finger and descending with the shorter index finger. This descent is always going to be the more problematic of the two, and you'll be able to feel the difference if you just descend through a major scale. So let's just take the first four notes of a D major scale. So D there at the seventh fret of the G string, we come down D, C sharp, B and A. So seventh, sixth and fourth frets on the G string, and then down to the seventh fret of the D string. Okay. If you start your picking with the middle finger and alternate the first four notes, you're gonna get this. Okay, so you're going to have middle, index, middle, index, and that is going to feel a lot more comfortable because we're descending with that and making the transition with that shorter finger. So really put that under the microscope. So strict alternate picking there. So two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, really, really focus on the alternate picking there. But now start the picking pattern with the index finger and you'll have to make that string transition with the longer middle finger. So one, two, one, two. So when we, so when we move on to the D string, you're gonna be coming back with that longer middle finger. So. So you have to get used to the feel of coming back with that longer finger. And you'll notice it's a little bit more uncomfortable when you first uh, try it out. And the temptation is going to be to, uh, to actually uh, rake there. So one, two, one, one. But it's worth trying to just, uh, or focusing on coming back with that middle finger, so. Like I said, raking is a solution to that uncomfortable problem. But there might be times when you aren't thinking too much and accidentally find yourself alternate picking instead of raking. And uh, when this happens, it's always good to be prepared. And I've spent many years practicing odd picking patterns on bass. So I'm less likely to get finger twisted. I'm generally comfortable whichever finger I'm uh, raking or picking with. That way, I mean, you know, I'm in control and can choose to rake or pick whatever the line. The key to getting over this hurdle is purposely practicing strict alternate picking and avoiding raking altogether. Yes, in performance, you want to use raking too. I'm just talking about the actual practice. So as a very simple exercise, you can just try playing up and down through a C major scale. So if we take the C at the, uh, the eighth fret of the E string and we work up, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and then back down. So we've got 8th and 10th fret on the E string, then 7th, 8th and 10th fret on the A string, and then 7th, 9th and 10th frets on the D string. Okay, simple C major scale. We're going to start with that first finger uh, in the picking hand, and we're going to alternate pick all the way through. We're not going to use raking at any point. And, uh, you know, this sounds like it's going to be a pretty easy exercise, but for a lot of you, if you're not used to this and you habitually you know, use uh, raking, it can be quite tricky because you're coming down at times with that second finger. So you just want to work up a few notes at a time. So first of all, just get used to the first three notes, C, D, E. Just take note of which finger you're landing on. So one, two, one. So just alternate picking. You can even practice building up speed on it getting used to that transition. Then add another note. So now we're finishing on the second finger, up to the G. You should be finishing on the first finger. These are all your waypoints. If you're not finishing on that first finger, you know you've gone wrong somewhere. Then up to the A there on the D string. So we're finishing on the second finger. Then up to the B. Finishing on the first finger. And we finish at the octave there of the C, picking with the second finger. And now here comes the tricky part. So we're up at the C, playing with the second finger there, the middle finger. Now we're gonna come back down. So we've got, so we just add another note. 
So we're going to be on the first finger on the B. Then when we reach the A, we're going to be on the second finger. Okay, so keep trying that and make sure that when you reach that last note, you're on that second finger. Then we come back down onto the A string there for the G with the first finger. So all's good so well uh, so far because uh, we're coming back down with the shorter finger. So then down to the F, which you're going to be playing with the second finger. Then down to the E, and we're picking with the first finger. And then we come down to the D and we're coming back on that longer second finger. Okay, that's where you're going to want to rake. But you've got to avoid that temptation and just come back with that longer finger, which is going to be a little bit weird for some of you. And then we're back where we started with that first finger and... Just work up and down, just alternate picking all the way through, okay? Obviously, I've rushed things there a little bit and, you know, I'm playing a little bit quicker than you might, but you just start as slow as you can. Just get used to each transition as you go. And yes, we're not really getting to the tricky part until the very end, but it's going to force you into kind of tracking and looking at waypoints that we're going to talk about in a second. And uh, it's just an all-round good exercise um, in both hands, okay? We can also try some trickier exercises that focus more on the transitions in rapid succession. So as an example, let's take a simple E major 7 chord shape here at the 7th fret of the A string. So we're going to have uh, the E, the B, and then we've got the D sharp up on the top. So that's going to be 7th fret A string, 9th fret on the D string, and the 8th fret up on the G string. First finger, third finger, and uh, second finger. So that's just a basic little kind of E major 7 kind of pattern, root 5th and 7th. And now we're just going to play up and down that pattern using alternate picking all the way through, starting with the first finger, so the index finger. So we're going to have one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So the finger that you're going to be focusing on here is the second finger, the middle finger, which we're using for the D string. You're going to keep feeling that as a kind of lever between the, the three strings. that pattern around. Okay, so just strict alternate picking. And then you can just switch the starting finger. So again, same pattern, starting with the second finger. And this one's gonna feel a little bit trickier, but it does get you used to that move of the, uh, of the longer uh, middle finger coming back down. So, and the first finger here is your lever between the two, or the three strings. So, middle, index, middle, index, middle, index, middle, index. So as you drop back down with that second finger, the middle finger, onto the A string, there, you're gonna feel, it's gonna feel a little, a little bit weird if you're not used to it. Like I said, longer finger and you're kind of coming back on yourself, having to skip over. But as you get used to that feeling, you can just build up speed. You can also try playing groups of three across the strings just in ascent with that same pattern. So if we take that, uh, that basic uh, pattern again and we start with the middle finger we can just play groups of three one two three and then back down so we're only ascending okay so you start I mean you can start on either finger you can start on the first or the second but each grouping will start on the opposite finger so uh, so index middle index middle Strict alternate picking throughout. So, 
but like I say, this is just getting used to starting on either finger and getting used to that uh, that feeling of un that, well, that uncomfortable feeling as we come back on the on the longer finger. Finally, for number 10 on the list, we've got tracking of the fingers. So this is a combination of the last two points. If you can work on your raking and alternate picking in isolation, you can then start to keep track of both techniques as you work through a line or a piece. Remember, when you're learning a piece, you want to use the same finger picking order every time that you practice. Otherwise, you're really practicing a different piece. Imagine if every time that you practiced a tricky line, you used a different fingering in the fretting hand. You know, it would quite obviously be different notes. It'd be a different line. So you want um, to keep the same patterns in the finger picking hand. So if you want to build speed and consistency, you want to be practicing the same thing each time. Now, obviously, remembering every single finger stroke in the picking hand through a complete piece of music is a lot of information to digest. And this is where slow, methodical practice is key. Use basic alternate picking as a default go-to technique, or maybe even single finger picking on a slow piece. But then take note of places where you might rake or do something a little bit different, like repeating a finger when you have a short gap in the music. This way, you can get to just play on autopilot as the fingers alternate, and then focus on the Breaking as it approaches. So let's take a quick melodic line like this one. So here I'm simply allowing the fingers to alternate on autopilot. And remember, I've practiced alternate picking in isolation, so that shouldn't be a problem. And I just need to take note of where the, uh, the actual raking is in there. So as I come up, as I come down from the D string to the A string, I'm gonna be raking, so that's my waypoint. Okay, so I'm just thinking on autopilot for the for the alternate picking. And just and if I play it very slowly, just really focusing on that alternate picking until I reach the rake. There it is. And then back to alternate picking. You can also use various string crossing points as waypoints that are gonna help you work out where you've gone wrong if you get finger twisted. For instance, if we play up and down through the major scale as we did earlier using strict alternate picking, you can use those string transitions uh, as waypoints. As we come down the scale, we should be on the index finger in the picking hand when we cross from the D to the A string. You know. That first finger, we use that as a waypoint. We know that if we're on that first finger as we come down across those strings, we're, we're fine. That's the, we've, we've stuck to our alternate picking. But then when we reach down to the, uh, to the E string there, where we come back on that second finger, I know that if somehow I end up back at the C on the, uh, on the second finger, I know we've gone wrong somewhere in terms of keeping that strict alternate picking. So you just have to create these little waypoints you know, if it's a really long piece, you know, like uh, I played the solfeggietto. You know, that kind of piece, it goes on for ages. And, you know, you don't want to remember every single bit of finger uh, picking throughout the whole thing. I'm just alternate picking throughout. But I will choose various notes there and string transitions as waypoints to know whether I've gone wrong. Because if I know leading into a hard bit whether, I've, whether I'm, you know, on track, uh, I know to get ready for something uh, that's, you know, uh, some problems if I'm not on the correct finger. So, yes, these last few tips are very analytical and we're putting our technique under the musical microscope somewhat, uh, which might be a bit too cerebral for some of you. And most of the time on simple bass lines, you're not gonna have a problem. But if you do get problems in your technique while learning a line, tracking your progress in the finger picking might help a lot. Okay, that's it for finger picking. Please hit like, subscribe to the channel for lessons every week, and leave a comment telling me what other areas of technique you'd like me to talk about. Okay, I'll see you next week.